The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. My name is Melissa Miller, and I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm a science writer and freelance writer for Star Wars Insider Magazine. And I'm James Floyd. I am your other co-host, and I also write for Star Wars Insider Magazine and StarWars.com. This episode of Star Wars Ologies, we're going to chat about reptiles and amphibians in Star Wars, as seen in all sorts of wildlife from Dagobah and all the other planets, and everyone's favorite egg layer, Frog Lady from The Mandalorian. Our guest expert today is Dr. Aaron McGee. Aaron is a herpetologist and science communicator with a PhD at the University of Arizona's School for Natural Resources and the Environment. Dr. McGee is an If Then ambassador for the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and she is the creator of the game Hashtag Find That Lizard. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Erin, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the definition of herpetology is? We'll start there. Sure. So pretty simple. It's someone who studies reptiles and amphibians, and I specifically study lizards. Hence, hashtag find that lizard. (laughs) How did you get into this field? Um, So I always wanted to work with animals. And when I got to college, one of my um, upperclassmen mentors introduced me to this guy working with lizards who became my undergraduate mentor. With him, I got like my first opportunity to do like field work. And like, I really fell in love with it. I was just like, you guys are paying me money. You're paying him real money to like go outside and walk around and catch lizards all day. Say less. (laughs) Say less. So, Sign me up. How can I do more? Did Did you catch lizards and such when you were a kid? Um, a little bit, like occasionally, but it wasn't one of those things where it's just like, yeah, I'm going out here to catch the lizard. I was trying to catch whatever I could see. If I could see it and I could grab it, <laughs> it was in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. And yeah, find that lizard for those who haven't already played is great because lizards, I mean, we'll get into it, but part of their adaptations are generally to sort of blend into the background, hide and stuff like that. So some she posts pictures that look like just, you know, the desert or something like that. And sure enough, there is a lizard in there. And I'm pretty bad at the game. I'll be honest. <laughs> it's it's hard when they're not moving. I, I have the benefit of when I'm out and about a lot of times they do move and I'm like, oh, look, there's a lizard in. Take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> that type yeah, of I think... A hundred percent of the time I see a lizard, it's because it does a little scurry or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. What's your history with Star Wars? Were you into it as a kid? Did it influence your love of science at all? Um, I can't really say that it was much of an influence, but I definitely did love the movies. And uh, Hayden Christensen was like one of my (laughs) major crushes for a very long time um, because of, you know, his role as Anakin and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I I grew up like my parents are super, you know, they I don't know if they would call themselves nerds, but they definitely are. And so um, (laughs) we definitely uh, grew up with the movies and every time something new came out we went to go see it so yeah awesome cool so how do amphibians and reptiles get lumped together into one science that's just how it was essentially um because like they they are relatively closely related to one another but they didn't necessarily have to be lumped together but they were just kind of like both like so like for herpetology like that where it comes from herp a or whatever and it just means creepy crawly things and so <laughs> that's a creepy crawly thing and that and that was the study of that and then eventually we were like okay actually these things aren't as closely related as we thought and they branch off and and now we're further looking into the to the different um organisms Okay. So what is the difference between a reptile and an amphibian? Is there a simple definition? Um, so it is pretty simple. You can think about their life histories or with reptiles in general, they don't go through any kind of like larval stage and a lot of amphibians will and amphibians have that life stage typically tied to the water or their whole entire life is tied to the water, whereas lizards are not and lizards have scales, whereas amphibians have smooth skin and so like with lizards they aren't you know slimy but 
And then uh, with amphibians, they also aren't slimy, but they have mucus, not slime. It's mucus, mm. and that helps them to keep their skin moist when they're out of the water. So, like, different things like that help differentiate them just, like, by looking at them and then looking at their life histories. How would a reptile or an amphibian be different in the galaxy far, far away when you've got lots of different planets? Like, that definition can be kind of different. It's true. That's just the Earth definitions of reptiles and amphibians. Well, then, if it doesn't fit the definition, is it really a reptile or an amphibian, or would it really just be something just totally different? Right. Yeah. Galactic reptiles or something like that. I mean, there's lots of examples, especially because in Star Wars, we have those famous like monoclimates, right? There's a whole ice planet. There's a whole swamp planet. So, you know, something like Tauntauns that are a snow lizard. Are there any sort of cold weather reptiles or amphibians on Earth? Yeah. So there are a lot of like high elevation uh, lizard species. And and I looked at lizards specifically. I don't know about our other reptiles. Um, and, and really, if it was going to be another one, it would be like snakes. But um, the main ones that I know of are lizards. So like for a while, the toad-headed agama was thought to be like the lizard that was living at the highest elevation at 5,300 meters on the Tibetan plateau. Wow. But relatively recently, there was this species of and I'm going to say this name wrong, Lyolamus lizard that was found in the Andean uh, mountains, and it was at 5,400 meters. <laughs> and so scientists were thinking that the reason that it was able to be at such a high altitude is because of climate change. You know, as the coldness of the mountain gets pushed up and up and up, these lizards are able to be like, okay, well, it's not as cold as it used to be there. So now we can kind of start to colonize these new environments. And so that's what they think is going on. But there's still research being done to figure figure out exactly why those lizards are able to live at such high altitudes. But it it isn't unusual to see lizards on a mountain. And as a matter of fact, my graduate research, though not as high uh, elevation as those mountains, um, was on a mountain. So the uh, lizards that I was studying do like higher elevations. So it's a thing. Converting those elevations for for those who don't think in meters, 5,400 meters is about 17,700 feet. So those are some pretty tall mountains that these lizards are living at. Yeah, that's wild. I never thought about lizards hanging out up there. So I like the idea that they're, I mean, I'm sure it is climate change, right? That's the the more likely scenario. But I just like the idea that like the Andean ones like got word like, oh, in Tibet, they go to 5,300 meters. We got to beat them by 100 meters. You know? Right. <laughs> I know that's not how lizards probably work, but. <laughs> you never know. There might be some kind of underground lizard communication thing that we don't know about. So we're we're already on to the underground lizard people. <laughs> Well, then wait, that's Doctor Who. That's that's oh. that's, that's different. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so something that comes up a lot in the natural history books and sort of background in Star Wars is reptavians, sort of reptile, avian, um, you know, so I guess it's sort of like dinosaurs um, here on Earth. But is that something that's a real term? Is that something that some concept artist just kind of came up with? Or yeah, how, how would that translate? It does sound like it should be something that's real. But it's not. <laughs> and I, I did Google it to make sure. I was like, and then no, <laughs> no, it's, it's not a real word. They, yeah, and I and I agree that it's probably would more describe like our dinosaurs and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of those things. So I'm thinking of Terrell Whitletch's uh, natural history book, and she's going to be a guest on Star Wars Ologies pretty soon, so we can ask her more about it too. Um, there's, you know, there's sort of those straight analogs like the crate dragon, which is sort of this big snake or lizard like thing, um, or the dewbacks, you know, those are just giant lizards. But some of those ones where there's like reptile, you know, mixes is something. Yeah, that I was like sure. uh, Boga, the Varactyl in Revenge of the Sith that Obi-Wan rides. It's kind of like oh, a yeah. big lizard, but it's very feathery headed. Right. I love that part, actually. Of That's Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, I really liked that. Uh, and the little coo noises it makes. <laughs> yeah, um, most of the time, uh, you're not going to get lizards or reptiles making too many noises. Uh, typically, if they're making a noise, it's because they're in some kind of pain in real life. Oh, okay. Well, we so. don't want that to be true. <laughs> hopefully, right. Hopefully, and, that's not the case in, in Star uh, Wars land. Yeah, it's like, wow, that puts Boga in a whole different light. It's like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Get off of me. 
Yeah, like, hopefully that's not what was happening. Hopefully, maybe it was like a force sensitivity thing where he right. like, you know, it only talks to force sensitive things or yeah. something like that. Or just like screaming. <laughs> I mean, Especially. don't we all? <laughs> Yeah, that sort of brings up the idea of uh, what James put down as utility herps, which I really enjoy <laughs> the combination of words there. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things in Star Wars, these sort of beasts of burden that unlike here on Earth, where we're limited to large mammals, you know, the do back patrol um, from the stormtroopers was always one of my favorites. So that's something that I sort of like to see. And I guess we don't have any big reptiles or amphibians on Earth. The Komodo dragon, maybe. But I don't think a lot of people ride those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can ride it for a second and then <laughs> ride it on your way up to heaven. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all you're going to get. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it kind of like makes sense with some of these, you know, mono ecosystem worlds where animals have to evolve to meet what the ecosystem is giving um, because we couldn't put, you know, like horses so on a desert world for the most part, you know, maybe camels. Well, I don't, I don't know what the comparison to water need would be for a camel versus like a lizard at that size. Mm-hmm. Because for the most part, lizards and most reptiles honestly get their water from the food that they're eating. Like, they can go and drink water, uh, specifically, like, you know, snakes and, like, turtles and uh, stuff like that. Lizards, you don't normally see them actually, like, drinking water. They typically get it from whatever their their food source is. Oh, interesting. So, like, when they eat bugs, that has a high enough water content or something? Yep. Yeah, which I guess makes you think that, like, with the dewbacks, it's like these are, you know, mounts, you know, beasts of burden that you have to feed meat to, presumably. Are there, I want to say vegetarian, but uh, herbivorous, yes. yes. <laughs> there are some uh, lizards, like iguanas, mostly, that will eat plants and, like, flowers and things like that, like some gnolls, but most of them are uh, insectivores or carnivores, like our Komodo dragons and other larger monitor lizards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Komodo dragons even have like a bit of, I'm going to get this right, venom in their bite or something like that too, I think. Yeah. So that would be something to think about for the dewbacks. Like maybe they just, I don't know, snack on a stormtrooper every <laughs> once in a while. Right. I bet if, you know, you're really mean to it, it's going to go for you as soon as your back is turned or you look weak. Yeah. Right, because it's like, how do you domesticate those things? That's right. the question. And yeah. I think that kind of gets into a little bit lizard intelligence and stuff. Because, like, how does it know? How does it know that, you know, friend, not food and that type of thing? Like, it has to have some kind of level of, you know, being able to learn and be taught this is what you do. This isn't what you do. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because I'm trying to think, I mean, I grew up, my brother was allergic to everything cute and fluffy, so we had snakes as pets growing up, and yeah, there certainly was no training them, but I, you know, I know that some people have, like, a real sort of more pet relationship with monitor lizards, so is there some level of domestication in reptiles? Not that I know of. I can't say no for sure because I'm not sure how that actually works. And and really, I want to give it a hard no because of whatever the rules of domestication are. Like that animal might realize that you're giving it its food, but it's not necessarily domesticated. Right. Um, like, you know, a cow or a sheep or a dog would be. It's just like, okay, I tolerate you in my space because you serve a purpose. <laughs> Right. And that's not right. the same thing. Now, I'm, yeah. I'm imagining like domestication means, you know, teaching them manners and stuff. And that's why Bosk the Trandoshan, he's not domesticated because he doesn't wear shoes on board the, the Star Destroyer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is one of the bounty hunters, right? Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea that he's there tapping his foot because no one <laughs> ever taught him manners as opposed right. to just, it looks cool. His foot <laughs> looks cool. I want to see it. <laughs> So in terms of intelligence, do people, are there studies about intelligence in lizards and other reptiles and amphibians here on Earth? There absolutely are some studies. And I was kind of like looking at it beforehand, uh, looking into like Google Scholar. And for people who don't know, Google Scholar is essentially just like a search database for a scientific publication. So when people do studies, they write a paper 
And then when the paper gets published, it gets put onto Google Scholar so you can search for it. And so like there definitely are studies of people like they gave this turtle or tortoise, I believe it was, they put it in a maze and it had to like solve the maze in order to get to a strawberry. So that was the treat for the reward for getting to the end of the maze. It would do it. There have been a couple of different uh, studies and just from my own personal, uh, you know, antidote when I'm out uh, catching lizards. And so I lasso lizards. And, and essentially what this is, is I have this tool that is a fishing pole. It's a telescopic fishing pole, meaning I can collapse and expand it as necessary. And I tie a line to the end of it. And then at the end of the line, I put a slip knot. And so then I have to get the slip knot over the lizard's head. And so essentially it's kind of like fishing and lassoing lizards at the same time and so sometimes a lizard will just sit there it'll just sit there for as long as you need to get the loop over its head but after that initial lassoing if that lizard ever sees you again it's running as soon as it hears you it hears you it smells you. <laughs> lizards actually have like really great hearing and because like they feel the vibration so like way before you even get to them they kind of like know that you're there as soon as it senses you, it runs away. It will never sit that well for you ever again because it doesn't want to be caught again. And do you think the lizard knows it's you? No, I don't know if it knows necessarily it's me versus maybe there's some kind of connection of a humanoid figure or maybe they see the actual lasso because typically I have the lasso in hand. And so maybe they're just like, oh, this lasso and then they're off. Um, so there's something about, you know, a person in, in the tool that they recognize and they're like, I don't want to mess with that ever again. Wow. Yeah. So that makes the the find that lizard game more of a game for you because there's no repeats. They all run away. <laughs> well, for field research, yes. Sometimes I just go out for fun. Like I go out on a hike on my own and I'm looking for lizards. And, and, you know, that gets into like the ethics of handling animals. I don't really catch animals now as an adult. I know better because <laughs> uh, it causes them stress. So I don't catch wild animals, including lizards, unless I have like a good reason to. That was what I was going to ask was what you're doing when you do lasso the lizard that they would remember, you know, just because you re-release them, right? I assume maybe you take a blood sample or something like that, but that's all permitted work and stuff like that, I assume. Yeah, it is uh, a traumatic experience for the lizard, um, for science. So when I catch them, uh, I was looking at lizard diets and how they might be impacted by climate change. So with the idea that uh, lizards would be losing an important food source, which are aquatic insects, so insects that live their larval stage in water. And so in the southwestern United States, we see a lot of stream drying due to drought and climate change. So if there's no water, there's no aquatic insects, there's no aquatic insects, like there's maybe less food for the lizards to eat. So when I would catch the lizards, I would look at their overall body conditions. I had a ruler, so I would measure them at different points. I would look to see if it was male or female. I would look to see if it had like parasites or stuff like that. I would take its weight. Um, and then for a way of permanent marking and to see what it was eating, because I was doing stable isotope analysis, I would take a toe clipping. So I would take some scissors and cut off a piece of toe so like they have like their nail and then like there's like a little bit of skin behind the nail and so like where that little bit of skin is that's where I would clip and so I would use that because a lot of other diet studies either make the lizard vomit what it was eating or they use the nice lizard so I was trying to figure out some less invasive ways to do it and since toe clipping is pretty standard for permanent identification um, I was like, well, if I'm already taking toes, I might as well use them in a way that would benefit the research that I'm trying to do. I was also thinking of doing fecal samples, but DNA testing is a lot of money and I didn't have that money as a grad student, so I couldn't do that. But I would also uh, put them in a piece of pool noodle and massage their bellies and that would encourage them to poop. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I made the lizards poop. And so yeah, if I was a lizard, I would not want to be caught again to go through that whole thing again. Wow. Now I'm imagining a crate dragon, and if you can just get to its tummy and rub its tummy, <laughs> you could make it poop. I don't know why you would want to do that, 
but <laughs> well, with there all it the is. crazy stuff that those things be eating, you never know what treasures you might find. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. There are some lizard species, or is it all lizard species that can drop their tail as like a distraction to predators? So there are some lizard species, not all of them, but um, some can drop their tails. And so essentially, if you think of their tails as a series of like Lego bricks, just think of like a long log of Legos. Um, That's kind of how their tails are built. But instead of Legos, they're cartilage. And so like there's a cartilage piece that has like the bumpy part of the Lego and that that fits into the next one and then so on and so forth. And so at each of those Lego pieces or cartilaginous vertebrae, they can drop their tail. However, they can only regrow their tail at each spot one time. So if a lizard drops its whole entire tail at its base, it can only regrow that one time. It will never drop again because it's a solid rod of cartilage, essentially, that's Uh, regrown. There are no more vertebrae in the tail. Okay, I never so, knew that. So oh. if you're a smart lizard, you break off tiny bits, like as big of a bit as you need to distract the predator. Exactly. So, and we don't know if they're actively thinking about where they're breaking it off or if it's just like an, an instinctual, I feel mm-hmm. a pinch here and I do away right. with however much yeah. I do away with. Now, we have Trandoshans like Bosk, and you know they have in some of the comics and other things that Trandoshans can regrow limbs so that like if uh, – I think there was a story where Chewbacca had ripped the limbs off of a Trandoshan bounty hunter, and then later on he's telling stories about Chewbacca, and then you look and he's got little itty-bitty stubby arms. <laughs> can lizards regrow limbs? Just their tails. Uh, Just their tails. axolotls, and I know I'm saying that incorrectly, but that amphibian, they can regrow mm-hmm their limbs but that's about the extent of it okay that's cool there's so many things i want to know about them because i ask a lot of questions <laughs> <But I'm ta. laughs> i'm curious about when you as a lizard scientist when you go and watch star wars content i don't know if you're watching the tv shows and stuff like that do they pop up on screen for you and you're like hey that's a reptile cool you know whether or not it's sort of an animal or like a species of you know people basically in star wars is that something you now notice and you think about absolutely not (laughs) no fair enough (laughs) i just i just take it as it is that it's not real life and (laughs) that it's something that somebody mostly made up Fair enough. Yeah, because we've talked to a couple of people who like work behind the scenes and, you know, they all watch David Attenborough or nature specials to get some ideas, I guess. And so I always like those little tidbits where it's like, oh, yeah, that's like almost true or kind of, you know, that makes sense, at least in the natural history, even if we're talking about Tatooine instead of Earth. But yeah, uh, fair enough. Also, just enjoying Star Wars is is a way to go. (laughs) In terms of like enormous herps, I'm curious about So dinosaurs are kind of reptiles, kind of birds, but obviously they were much bigger back then. And there's some, is it like the one with the sail that's like a full reptile, like not a dinosaur? Oh, the Dimetrodon that's not a dinosaur? Right. I'm just curious, I guess, about big herps that used to be around back in the day. Was that just like oxygen content on Earth? Like, why don't we have enormous reptiles anymore? Yeah, so, like, dinosaurs aren't really reptiles. Uh, Reptiles, you know, descended down. But, yeah, it's essentially the oxygen content and, you know, other major extinction events and evolution said no. Wow. Uh, Now I'm thinking, like, of the crate dragon, and we see it, like, burrowing through rock. But there's got to be a lot of lizards, you know, that can dig through sand. So what do you think it would take strength-wise to be able to go through solid rock? (laughs) Well, I think that it helps to be that big, (laughs) but also like it would have to have really, really hard scales and just like thinking like it would have to have some kind of like momentum. Like it, I don't think that it could just like break through like that kind of rock from, you know, being still, but yeah, definitely that is the definition of hard head. (laughs) Right. To, To be able to, to go through something like that. But I don't, I don't really see why not. At that size. Is the Rancor also supposed to be reptilian? I, I looked it up and yeah, it's it's categorized as a as a reptile, which I don't know. Huh. What do you what do you think? Could it be a reptile? Okay, which one is this? Well, it's my favorite. So the Rancor is in Return of the Jedi. 
the one that's like in the pit of Jabba's palace that he uses to like eat his enemies. And then uh, Luke kills it, which I think is quite rude. Yes, um, I remember now. Yeah, so very big bipedal sort of stands up like that. And it has these big claws, which I guess I can see being sort of reptilian. But it has like a little tail. I'm just not sure. Yeah, it doesn't have much of a tail. It's got like a little stubby tail. Like it, maybe its tail fell off or something. Yeah, potentially. It looks like, you know, maybe. But it doesn't really look like it has scales, which is right. characteristic yeah. of reptiles. Or maybe it could, I don't know. It could be some kind of lizard reptile hybrid thing somebody was you know doing some kind of experiment and made these things or maybe it just has really really tiny scales so that it looks really smooth and not scaly Mm. and it Mm. is just a giant bipedal lizard interesting like like the way sharks and stuff you don't really see the scales when further away but when you rub their skin you can find the scales and you're like ouch but yeah that could be so they don't rub sharks (laughs) Also, don't rub rancors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but they. Oh, I want to so bad, though. <laughs> I always liked that the rancor had like a, you know, owner, basically. It was a it was almost a pet or whatever. So I, I want to pet a rancor, but. Back uh, into that I, domestication. Right. Exactly. No, exactly. Well, and that, they, that sort of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. The Dathomirian witches, they ride rancors. And in other places, okay. they use rancors as rides and as, you know, war machines. Right. So I know you're not an amphibian scientist, but I am curious if you have any thoughts about the Gungans since you uh, are into the prequels. I love Jar Jar Binks. He's okay, one of my perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but so, like, the thing about them is that because they seem like a lot of their most of their life history seems tied to the water, but they can be out of it. So it would seem like they would have to continuously be making some kind of like mucus to protect their skin um, and to like not dry out all the way, unless it's just one of those things where they can just breathe underwater. And in Mm -hmm. that case, I'm just like interested in how do you have both gills and lungs? Like, what is it that is making it that you can breathe oxygen in air and then also in water, uh, that Uh, type of thing? When I was researching for this episode, I found out that Gungans are egg layers. And so they're basically regular amphibians that they have like a larval stage and there's little Gungan tadpoles. And, you know, then they eventually grow up into bipedal Interesting, because I don't watch episode one all that often. But when they're under the Gungan city underwater they're breathing air again right like mm-hmm. don't they go into like bubbles yeah like they the jar jar cities... swims through the water without any right. sort of air thing so he can obviously breathe in water or respire in water but then yeah their whole city is in air bubbles which maybe he's not breathing in the water maybe he's just holding his breath oh, for a right. really long true. time true that's what i was gonna say like if they don't ever speak in water then are they really breathing in the water or is it just able to swim that far you know because like frogs now correct me if i'm wrong Frogs, like when they're tadpoles and stuff like that, breathe water. But then when they're frogs, they breathe air, but they can swim underwater, right? Yes. So maybe it's sort of like that. So. Potentially. Or it could just be it. one of those things where it's just like, okay, we just okay, need fine. to be able to have like a reason for right. the humans to be able to have how they going to talk underwater and stuff like that. We got to go to them. Yeah. Being able to hold their breath for a long time kind of like makes the most sense. But if it's an amphibian, if it has a larval stage, then it's more amphibian than reptile, then, you know, maybe they can do both. Yeah. And for whatever reason, maybe at the adult stage, being in the air is more preferable or something yeah. like that. And they just don't show us, you know, Jar Jar back in like a tank of goo or something <laughs> like that on the ship every night, like when he's on Tatooine, because I would expect that he, yeah, a water dwelling species wouldn't hold up very well. Yeah, he he does say that the sun is doing murder to his skin. So okay. they do address that issue. I feel like being an amphibian sort of explains a little bit more about why some of the Gungans look different, right? Like, doesn't the like leader of the Gungans have yeah. sort of a different... Like his eyes are set differently and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So maybe it explains some of that. Like that's just an even older life stage or yeah. Uh, yeah, life that, stage. That's cool that, that yeah, you could metamorphose. I, I was thinking it was just dimorphic that some look mm-hmm. more tall humanoid and some look more the squat. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. I feel like I'm going to have to go back and watch those sequences again. 
in Empire Strikes Back and Dagobah, they basically brought real world snakes and lizards onto the set and, you know, kind of draped them on stuff. And I don't know, do you get a chance to like look at those and see if you could identify what they were? Or... Yeah. So uh, first things first, you had a couple of links in here for California <laughs> Herbs, and I love that website. So uh, just a quick plug for them. If you're in California and you're trying to identify a reptile or an amphibian, California Herbs um, essentially is this huge database that gives you all kinds of descriptions for all the reptiles and amphibians that you're going to find in the state. And, and they're fantastic. The One of them, the nudge, that definitely looked like a green iguana to me. The sleen looked like a monitor lizard to me, and that was confirmed by California Herbs. And then the snake was a python. Okay. Yeah. So these are the part. This is the parts of Dagobah where Luke is yeah. is training or or running around or whatever. And there's just yeah. what's clearly a bunch of California <laughs> yeah. reptiles and amphibians yeah. or reptiles yeah. sort of. Brought yeah, and to I set. think in inside Yoda's hut, Luke moves oh. a, a little striped snake, and I think that's a king snake. Yeah, say one of those. One. one of those is venomous, and one of those isn't. Right? There's a like yeah, red touches snake black snake. Thing. Coral snake, <laughs> yeah. which is not yeah. almost, that rhyme gets you right most of the time, but it's not always true. <laughs> okay. So I do have to say, if you don't know what it is, don't pick it up. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> always good advice. Yes, always good for advice. pretty much any type of science. If you don't right, know yeah. what it is, don't pick it up. Right, exactly. Like as a chemist, I'm a don't lick it sort of person. Whereas when we interviewed the geologists, like, of course, lick that rock, you know. So <laughs> I think with herbs, you know, maybe this is how we should classify all sciences, the lick and don't lick variety. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so for herbs, definitely don't lick. Do not lick. What about those people who lick toads? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't um, don't do that. And it's honestly like it's really bad for their toads. Um, there's a lot of like work being done right now. And uh, I know like with the Tucson Herpological Society with the Sonoran Desert Toad, they're doing like a lot of outreach and activism because um, it's impacting uh, the Sonoran Desert Toad population and stuff out there because people are going out there to they, they poach the toads and they lick it and like they they, they cause you know injury and stuff to That's the toes because they're real? trying to get high yeah it's 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 oh. a, actually a really big problem like do wow. not like leave the toes alone when you know an agency's social media account is like i can't believe we have to say this everyone don't lick the toads <laughs> wow now i'm imagining you know grogu licking frog lady <laughs> and just getting totally you know hallucinated oh. yeah and, it, and it's yeah. dangerous like you can really have like a really uh, bad trip and your mind is not going to be the same afterwards. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. There was that thing on Book of Boba Fett. What did they do with that little lizard? That oh, it went up his nose. That's right. Did you watch Book trip. of Boba Fett? I haven't. Yet. Okay. Yeah. There's like a sort of vision quest type sequence where, yeah, they're like, there's this little lizard, like an, it looks like an anole or something like that. And he's like, oh, a cute little lizard. And it like climbs up his nose. And then he goes off on this quest, basically. And it was like, what? So don't sniff yeah, the no. lizards, is what you like, There is Star no Wars. lizard that will do that for you. That is don't, fiction. Don't sniff don't. the lizards. No licking, no sniffing. Don't just, touch. Just look at don't it. Don't touch. Just, just look. look at just it. look. You know, right. it's like when your parents uh, take you into the store, hands in your pockets. Don't touch nothing, okay? <laughs> I like it. Or take a picture and send it to Dr. Ann McGee for Find That Lizard. Exactly. But nothing else. I'm curious what your favorite Star Wars character is. Ooh, that's a hard question that I should have anticipated, but didn't. We should start warning people that we're not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's better no? that okay. we don't. Okay. Uh, my favorite character. I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite character, to be honest. It sounds like the prequels are sort of your trilogy. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't. That's such a hard question. So if someone was interested in getting into herpetology, what would be the path you would suggest? Um, I would suggest like looking for your local like herpetological society. Uh, so these are essentially like clubs for professional and amateur herpetologists so herpers they typically will like run maybe like different programs or different speaker series and stuff like that 
there's the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. So you can look to see if they have like a local chapter and you can get involved with them. You can look to see if there's any like herpetologists at like the local university or college, community college campuses and see if they're looking for any like lab techs or, you know, field techs and stuff like that. Even if you're like in like elementary school or whatever, um, sometimes people will be like, yeah, we're doing like this outreach event and be able to like let kids into their labs and stuff like that. Really, I would just say to go outside and explore and then, you know, you'll find like these other resources. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, I just kind of like fell into the herpetology and, and lizards and stuff. I just got lucky where somebody connected me to the right person. Um, so don't stress about it. Just have fun and just look to see what resources are available to you locally. Erin, tell us a little bit more about where we can find you on social media, maybe your if-then work and those sorts of things. Yeah, so you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Afro, A-F-R-O underscore Herper, H-E-R-P-E-R. Yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, my socials. I have a website, AaronBeeky.com. Um, I have a contact form there. And, and so uh, if you have like uh, any, like I do speaking engagements and other podcasts and stuff like that. So I'm always happy to, to chat about that. And I do like a lot of outreach events. So yeah, I'm, I'm out here. Well, we'll put all those links in the show notes. Um, but also I want to point out that that's Aaron spelled E-A-R-Y-N. And uh, also you were on our Jurassic World panel for Comic-Con last year, right? Yes, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here. I feel like I learned a lot about reptiles and amphibians and maybe also not to take Star Wars quite so seriously when it comes (laughs) to representing them. And that's okay. (laughs) I have fun with it. So, (laughs) yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Erin. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Dr. Aaron McGee, and we want to thank all of you for listening. Are you looking for the links we might have talked about? Check out our show notes page available at skywalkingthroughneverland.com slash star dash warsologies slash. Also, check out the Star Wars Ologies YouTube channel where we post the episodes with related visuals from Star Wars. If you have an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies or you know an expert that we should interview, let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram, or Star Wars Ologies, O-L-O-G-I-E-S, at gmail.com. We also have a fan group on Facebook. We cleverly named it the Star Wars Ologies Podcast Fan Group, so join today and chat with us and your fellow listeners. And please also rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite service, and share it with your friends. No topic is off limits, even figuring out how the binary language evaporators is different from the binary language of load lifters. We are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can also find a variety of other great shows about Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel. That includes Talking Apes, the Max FX podcast, Neverland Clubhouse, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. There's also a YouTube show called Today in Star Wars History. You can find all of these at skywalkingnetwork.com. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies when we discuss dance in Star Wars. We're also going to be at Star Wars Celebration in London, April 7th through 10th. We'll have more details about the dates of the panels coming soon. But for now, we know that we'll be hosting three panels. One is called Making Star Wars Magic Behind the Scenes Stories, where we'll chat with some creatives from the various Star Wars movies and TV shows. We also have the Science of Return of the Jedi, celebrating the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. And we have... Andor, The Empire, and A History of Resistance, looking more at the social science of basically resisting tyranny. So uh, look for those at Star Wars Celebration in London. Yeah, and come introduce yourselves and let us know that you're a fan of the show. It'll be great to see you. 